Delicious in Dungeon is a manga that not enough people are talking about. And to be fair, I wouldn't have known about it either if it wasn't for the YouTube channel and Twitter profile Lines in Motion, which is a place where I get so many great manga recommendations. Please go subscribe to Lines in Motion. The production value of their videos is mind-blowing. Anyway, Delicious in Dungeon is a wonderful fantasy manga. If you are a fan of world building, of lore, of the way that fantasy stories and worlds are constructed, you will really appreciate how Delicious in Dungeon works. Cool. Delicious in Dungeon starts with a single page of exposition. There's a village in a medieval world, and a strange, sickly little man crawls out of a catacomb, and he says that he is the king of a forgotten city, a golden place beneath the ground that was swallowed up and destroyed and made forgotten by this evil wizard. And he says, I was the king, and if you go down into the dungeon and find my city, you will have bountiful rewards and you can be the new king and blah blah blah. All this very familiar fantasy trope stuff. Page two, we cut to a party. A very generic fantasy party. You've got a tank, a magic user, a skittish little lockpicky guy, and a girl who gets immediately eaten by a dragon. While they're fighting this big dragon, they mention that they're hungry and low energy, and then one of the party gets eaten. They wake up outside the dungeon, collapsed on the floor. It feels like an RPG. They have time to rescue this member of their party that got eaten, because dragons hibernate a lot, they very slowly digest things, it's kind of Boba Fett in the Sarlacc pit situation. There's time for them to go back, fight the dragon again, defeat it, and rescue this party member. But the problem that people have when they go down into this dungeon is that they have to take rations with them, fill up their bags with supplies, and cook things and prepare things before they go. It takes a lot of preparation. And the leader of the party, Leos, he has this grand idea. Why don't we just eat the monsters in the dungeon? While we're down there, we just kill monsters, cook them, and eat them. And the rest of this party think that it's disgusting. Right now, you've got three members of the party. You've got Leos, you've got the elf magic girl, and the tiny halfling lockpick guy. And the other two think that this is a gross idea. But they give it a go. And while they're giving it a go, they meet this brilliant dwarf character who is so well drawn, so well animated, so expressive. I love the way that he is depicted. And he is a professional scavenger, scouter, and cook of monster parts. He knows exactly what he's doing down there in the dungeon with regards to cooking and preparing meals made from monster bits. So this is a dungeon crawler. You are making your way deeper and deeper into this dungeon with this party. They're learning about each other and their skills. They're learning about the world and they're cooking monsters as they're going down. They encounter a lot of things they don't expect. They're confused, they're frightened, and most of the comedy comes from the fact that the elf magic character doesn't ever want to try any of the food and every time she eats a meal she ends up loving it and thinks it's the best thing ever and then she doesn't learn and once again she's like no we can't cook this man-eating plant that's crazy talk and then she loves the man-eating plant soup that she eats. It's formulaic and episodic to a point but I haven't read that many chapters yet I'm just eager to talk about how well constructed all of this is. It really is a love letter to the concept of lore, the way that this dungeon builds and builds and builds as it goes. It's a bestiary. If you've ever played an RPG or read Lord of the Rings or watched a big epic fantasy story like Game of Thrones and you've enjoyed all of the details and nuances, all of the politics, the names of places, the geography of it, the history of it, you've ever wanted to read entire appendices and bestiaries detailing all of the flora, the fauna, the architecture, the world design, clothing and armor and weapons, and all of the physical aesthetic details, that's kind of what you're getting here. But it's mostly focused on the plants, the animals, the monsters of the world, because they're gonna cook and eat them. So this manga is a generic fantasy story that is brought to life in very funny and clever and detailed ways through the fact that it's also kind of a fantasy recipe book, a bestiary, an exploration of the concept of lore 
and monster design and world design. It's so much fun. So much of the reason that people enjoy fantasy in the first place is looking at the imagination and the world building and design of the creatures and the physical world itself, the space, the plants, the nature of it, the hidden history behind it all, ruins and caves and unknown strange and forgotten things, and it's all here. But it's all within the context of eating stuff and making recipes. If there's one thing I love about fantasy, it's the imagination of creators. When a fantasy story has a really interesting political system, or even just naming conventions, the way that characters are designed, and little details about how things like birthdays, traditions, festivals, cultural details work, I love all of that stuff. And again, this is a love letter to all of that, but it focuses on the monsters themselves. And think about things like Pokemon. Think about how much we adore monster names, designs, the background information about them. When you read the Pokedex in Pokemon and you learn about things like rituals, eating habits, mating habits, all of the details about how the ecosystem and the food chain works, that's what you get here. Very, very early on, I think the first monster they eat is this strange running mushroom thing that looks like a twisted, monstrous version of something from a Mario game. And they figure out how to cook it and eat it and make it part of a meal. And they look at things like what nutrients you're getting from it. So if you love the nitty gritty and details of monster design and world design, this manga has all of that in spades while also being very funny. There are stakes, there is world design, there is character growth, there is a wonderful party dynamic between these characters, and so much of it hinges on good comedy. Pretty simple comedy that is accessible to all ages. It's wonderfully translated. It can be enjoyed by readers of all different ages. I don't know if this is considered a seinen or a shonen or whatever. I get confused by all of that. So much of it is so arbitrary. But whatever it is, this is a fantasy manga that really rewards your attention to detail and really makes you smile and laugh at its creativity, its ingenuity, its web of design, and the way that the characters interact with the world itself, what they're getting up to, how they enjoy each other's company, little details about their relationships, and it's all drawn with spectacle, but in a kind of sketchbook way. It's not hyper-detailed, it's not super cartoonish either, it lands somewhere in the middle, a very comfortable kind of sketchbook design that I really, really appreciate. Character expressions are brilliant, the archetypal design of their different classes is lovely. It's a delightful, delightful manga. I can't wait to read more of it and see where the story goes. But Delicious in Dungeon is something that more people need to be talking about. It is a great fantasy manga. Check it out and subscribe for books.